Hi folks, Brother Martins here in Laie, Hawaii. I come to you today to reveal with you some of the fundamental principles of the law of consecration and stewardship in the United Order. This is not a topic that um, is fairly commonly um, addressed in our uh, classes, but it's one that uh, is very significant and very important, not only for our temporal salvation, but also for our uh, ability to live up to uh, sacred covenants we make in the house of the Lord, in the temple. So, what we're going to do here is we're going to review just superficially, okay, we're not going to get into too many details, but superficially, what those uh, basic principles are. Now, right from the start, I think we need to make some um, uh, clarifications here. Uh, a lot of people confuse, you know, and they kind of, uh, you know, mix up, you know, the law of consecration and stewardship with the United Order, and they, they use these terms as if they were synonymous, and that's not really the case. The law of consecration and stewardship, we could say that uh, it is a set of uh, commandments, instructions, clauses, covenants, and promises um, that the Lord made for the temporal salvation of his people. And this is a law for, you know, many uh, dispensations. We have some. We have some evidence in the scriptures that something along these lines uh, has been practiced in um, in ancient times. The United Order, on the other hand, so we have on one side the law of consecration and stewardship, and on the other side we have the United Order. The United Order we could um, define it as an organization. Uh, let's call it an auxiliary organization inside the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And uh, the purpose of this auxiliary organization would be to manage the implementation of the law of consecration and stewardship. So the law of consecration and stewardship, a set of commandments, expectations from the Lord, and uh, covenants, instructions, and promises, and the United Order, an organization that manages the implementation of the law. So having said that, let's go to the scriptures. And uh, we're going to use a great deal of passages from the Doctrine and Covenants. So let's begin with something very, very basic. You know, as I said, a fundamental principle. So we're going to go to the foundation of this. And for that, we're going to take a look at um, Doctrine and Covenants, section 104 in which the, the Lord states the following, For it is expedient that I, the Lord, should make every man accountable as a steward over earthly blessings which I have made and prepared for my creatures. I, the Lord, stretched out the heavens and built the earth, my very handiwork, and all things therein are mine, and it is my purpose to provide for my saints, for all things are mine. But it must needs be done in mine own way. And behold, this is the way that I, the Lord, have decreed to provide for my saints, that the poor shall be exalted, and that the rich are made low. For the earth is full, and there is enough, and to spare. Yea, I prepared all things, and have given unto the children of men to be agents unto themselves. Therefore, if any man shall take of the abundance which I have made, and impart not his portion, according to the law of my gospel, unto the poor and the needy, he shall with the wicked lift up his eyes in hell, being in torment. So, this is the very basic, the very fundamental. The Lord is saying, look, the earth is full, there is enough and to spare. And he said, I gave unto, uh, 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 unto the children of men to be agents unto themselves, to administer the abundance of the earth for the benefit and the temporal salvation of all. And that's where, you know, the wheels come off the wagon, as the saying goes. 
because uh, for because of the the great apostasy people lost many truths including this truth about what's the lord the, the lord's will concerning the temporal salvation of the people temporal salvation meaning you know providing for them food shelter clothing you know access to health care all these things that's what we mean by temporal salvation access to all these things at a, to an extent that is sufficient for them to meet their needs and so the lord has given to his children to be agents unto themselves and so this is the reason why we see so much poverty and hunger uh, around the world because in general uh, because of the apostasy uh, people have been failing to fulfill this uh, divine expectation now let's go back to the scriptures and take a look at a, two examples one in the new testament and one in the book of mormon in which uh, the lord had uh, at least a set of people a group of people practicing these principles in the new testament in acts chapter 4 after the savior's resurrection and ascension into heaven uh, the apostles implemented uh, uh, this particular program if you will and um, Luke recorded this in the book of Acts. And the believers were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said that the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of, of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Now, I want to call your attention here to uh, something. You know, uh, in classes, in church, and uh, at universities, um, when people read this passage, and the next one we're going to read also in the Book of Mormon, in 4th Nephi, nine out of ten times pretty much you know uh people add a preposition that is not in the text you see they look at the they read and they say they had all things in common but if you look at the text that preposition in is not there they had all things common meaning health care was common food was common shelter housing was common clothing was common all things were common among them and this is the language we find in the book of mormon as i said fourth nephi they had all things common among them therefore they were not rich and poor bond and free but they were all made free and partakers of the heavenly gift so, in two previous occasions, uh, in ancient times, we had uh, this, we have, you know, exp we, we understand that this is also the program that allowed uh, the city of Enoch, the people in the city of Enoch, to not have any poor among them, the city of Zion, prior to Noah's flood. Now, going back to the Doctrine and Covenants, now, we're, we go to section 42. A revelation known as the law of the church and right there at the beginning of this dispensation the Lord set the clauses of this um, of this program if you will and here's what the Lord stated then and behold thou wilt remember the poor and consecrate of thy properties for their support that which thou hast to impart unto them and inasmuch as ye impart of your substance unto the poor, ye will do it unto me. And they shall be laid before the bishop of my church and his counselors. And again, if there shall be properties in the hands of the church, or any individuals of it, more than it is necessary for their support after this first consecration, it shall be kept to administer to those who have not, that every man who has need may be amply supplied and receive according to his wants. I already want to call your attention here 
okay, to some key terms. And we're going to come back to this a little later. But uh, every man who has need may be amply supplied and receive according to his wants. Not according to what the bishop thinks that he needs. According to his wants. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's go back to section 42. Therefore, the residue shall be kept in my storehouse to administer to the poor and the needy as shall be appointed by the high council of the church and the bishop and his council. And for the purpose of purchasing lands for the public benefit of the church and building houses of worship and building up of the new Jerusalem, that my covenant people may be gathered in one in that day when I shall come to my temple, and this I do for the salvation of my people. Now, we find this also in the Doctrine and Covenants, some specific instructions the Lord gave to the first bishop in this dispensation, Bishop Edward Partridge. And um, here is what we read in section 51 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Wherefore, let my servant Edward Partridge and those whom he has chosen Appoint unto the, these people their portions, every man equal, according to his family, according to his circumstances, and his wants and needs. The bishop and those he have chosen, his counselors and others, appointed to these people their portions. Okay, this is one of those key terms that I'm going to come back to a little later. Every man equal, but look at how this equality Look at how this equality is implemented according to his family, according to his circumstances, according to his wants, and according to his needs. So, continue with these instructions to Bishop Partridge. And let my servant Edward Partridge, when he shall appoint a man his portion, give unto him a writing that shall secure unto him his portion, even this right and this inheritance in the church. Until he transgresses and is not accounted worthy by the voice of the church, according to the laws and covenants of the church, to belong to the church. And if he shall transgress and is not accounted worthy to belong to the church, he shall not have power to claim that portion which he has consecrated unto the bishop for the poor and needy of my church. Therefore he shall not retain the gift. But shall only have claim on that portion that is deeded unto him. I know it's a lot of information here, but don't worry. We're reading all these passages. Later, I'm going to come back and I'm going to give a little bit of an overview, a little bit of an explanation. So, hang in there. We have a few more passages here. Again, Doctrine and Covenants, section 82. And you are to be equal. Or in other words, you are to have equal claims on the properties for the benefit of managing the concerns of your stewardships. Every man, according to his wants and his needs, inasmuch as his wants are just. Ah, here is something that uh, the Lord clarifies. Yes, it's according to the person's wants, but those wants have to be just or justifiable. Continue on. And all this for the benefit of the church of the living God, that every man may gain other talents, yea, even a hundredfold, to be cast into the Lord's storehouse, to become the common property of the whole church. Every man seeking the interest of his neighbor and doing all things with an eye single to the glory of God. So these are some of these fundamental principles that uh, I, I mentioned. Now, as I mentioned, there are some key, key terminology that we need to pay attention to. So here are some of these key words. Stewardships, inheritances, talents, portions. In the Doctrine and Covenants, the revelations that talk about, you know, stewardship, you know, they, they use these different terms, but they all mean the same thing. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about them. Other key terms, storehouse common property, wants, and needs. So, now let me try to show, in a very, very simple, very simple example 
of how this was uh, uh, set up when they were supposed to have to, to work. And uh, as I said, it's a very simple example. Okay, there are many details that I'm not going to get into. And uh, don't try to transpose this to our days because in our uh, uh, economic systems in the early now in the early 21st century uh, probably they would not work very well we would need additional revelations to see how this would work but right now okay let's just start with the basics here let's take a look at this diagram so here's how this was supposed to work first of all Entering the United Order was voluntary. Nobody was obligated, nobody was obligated to enter the United Order. The person desiring to enter would have them to manifest that desire. And so how would that take place? Well, the person would go home and make an inventory. And I represent this inventory by this little spreadsheet here. Makes an inventory of his or her possessions, all their material possessions. The house, the, uh, the, the, the lot, you know, the, the, the land where the house is, and all the furniture inside the house, all the, uh, the utensils in the kitchen utensils, and all the clothes and shoes and um, uh, equipment, everything they would have in the house, make a full list, a full inventory of everything. And then the person would write a document called a deed. A deed is a document that transfers ownership. And the deed would essentially say, I so and so on this particular date, okay, hereby by this uh, document, I consecrate my property, my material possessions to the Lord and to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, and I present this to the Bishop of the Church according to commandments and so on, the person would sign this. So the person would go to the bishop's office with that deed, with that document, and that inventory, and give this in the hand of the bishop and say, Bishop, I decided to enter the United Order and make this covenant. People enter the United Order by covenant. And uh, here is my consecration. So the bishop would look at the deed, look at the inventory, and uh, so I'll Thank you very much. Uh, you know, uh, Lord bless you. Now, the person, the bishop, then would ask the person, "What are your wants and what are your needs?" Essentially, what the person would probably say was, "Well, I need the same house, those same clothes, those same equipments and furniture and shoes and uh, the the land, uh, you know, kitchen utensils, everything that I consecrated." The bishop then would give the person back, just like the Lord instructed Bishop Edward Partridge, another document, another deed, granting the person those things the person asked for, but this time as a stewardship, or as an inheritance, or as a talent, or as a portion. So the person would get this deed from the bishop, this document, go back to that same house, wear those same clothes, make use of the same kitchen utensils and the same shoes and everything. It's just that from this point on, that house is no longer, no longer belongs to that person. It is now the house of the Lord. Those clothes belong to the Lord. Those kitchen utensils, that furniture, all belong to the Lord. And the person uses those things as a steward. And as we then use the parable of the talents in the New Testament, the person would have to take very good care of all these properties because they belong to the Lord. So the house has to be repaired and, uh, you know, a fresh coat of paint from time to time. And uh, the clothes have to be very well taken care of. Everything has to be used, you know, in a very good and wise and beneficial way for the benefit of the people who live in the house. And uh, uh, um, then the person then would inherit a certain blessings. The Lord would multiply the, the person's welfare according to that. Now, this then is sort of the basics. And uh, 
the person receiving that stewardship, that inheritance, that is that person's or that person's family's inheritance. It can be passed on from generation to generation in that person's family. That's why it's also called an inheritance. But observe something very important here. This is another misconception people have. They are not sharing anything with their neighbors. That inheritance, that stewardship belongs to that person and that person's family, not to their neighbors. If the neighbors want something, let them go to the bishop and ask for it. There is no sharing. A lot of times I hear conversations in, in classes and, and people say, Oh yeah, the law of consecration is about sharing everything. So no, it's not sharing. It's about receiving an inheritance, consecrating everything and receiving everything back as, as an inheritance. Oh, well, then, well, what is what is that all about? About the poor and the rich, the poor being exalted, the rich being made low. Well, here's where things get really interesting. Let's suppose somebody has three houses, a very wealthy person, three houses, 50 pairs of shoes. Let's make something simple here. So a person goes to the bishop with the inv inventory and with the deed, and uh, the bishop asks the person, what are your wants, what are your needs? The person could say, well, see, bishop, I don't need the three houses. Two will be enough for me, one for me to live, and another one that is, is I have this little ranch out of town that I, I use for to grow some uh, some potatoes there, uh, some veggies, and also for family reunions, and so this is what I want. Uh, I don't need 50 pairs of shoes. Uh, I'll keep 20, and um, and the others then, where do they go? Well, bishop then will keep the other 30 pairs of shoes in the bishop's storehouse. And what's in the bishop's storehouse, as we read in the Doctrine and Covenants, that is common property of the whole church, meaning everybody has claims on the material possessions that are in the bishop's storehouse. So that extra house, for example, it's under the care of the bishop until somebody comes with a consecration that does not include a house. And the bishop will ask, what are your wants? And they're going to say, well, I need a house, bishop. I don't have one. And he said, well, we have a house here under our care. And we can give this house, you know, if the size is proper for you and your family, uh, we can give you this house as an inheritance, as a stewardship. Oh, bishop, I need. Uh, I have two pairs of shoes. I need uh, another two pairs of shoes. Well, we have lots of shoes here in the storehouse. Okay, you can go there and, and pick the shoes that you want and have those extra shoes as your inheritance, as a stewardship for you. So this is how the Lord used the term that uh, the rich are made low and the poor are exalted. Okay, those who have too much. Okay, those who have a lot, perhaps they don't think that they have too much, but they have a lot, will continue to have sufficient for their needs. Those who do not have okay, enough, they will also receive sufficient for their needs. And that's how we read in the Book of Mormon that they were all equal. They were not rich and poor. But they were all, all taken care of. All of them were living comfortably according to their circumstances and according to their needs. Now, another thing that uh, people often ask, is, oh, look, you know, uh, isn't that kind of a, you know, sounds like socialism and so on. No, it's not. First of all, because uh, remember, belonging to the United Order is voluntary. It was voluntary. We don't have the United Order today, but it was voluntary. And as we also read in the Doctrine and Covenants, the person could get out of it if they wanted. So if the person wanted, the person would keep whatever properties the person had received from in that deed from the bishop to him or her. They would not be able to get the access to those other things that they had consecrated. That's one of the stipulations okay, uh, of the law. But they will keep what was deed unto them. 
and so and that would be their property from that point on so people had to think very carefully before deciding to participate in the united order and so this is how the you know in a very superficial way we uh, can explain what the law consecration stewardship was and the united order that administered or that managed the implementation of the law now we need to uh, observe here that uh, nowadays we're at the beginning of the 21st century 2021 we do not have stewardships or the united order however we do have the law consecration uh, some people sometimes ask us oh when are we going to leave the law consecration we are leaving the law consecration in fact one of the reasons why i'm making all these explanations is because this is a law that we need to understand because we make a sacred covenant in, a, in sacred places in the house of the Lord to accept to accept the law of consecration. It's just that since we don't have that stewardship component or the United Order, for us nowadays, consecration means to consecrate our time, our talent, and other means that we have. And we do that. We do consecrate. It's just that sometimes we don't think that we are doing it. For example, those of us who serve full-time missions, we have consecrated our lives, really. Not only our time and our talents, but our lives for a year and a half or two years or for as long as our health and other personal circumstances allowed us to serve on a, on a, on a full-time mission or on a service mission. That's consecration. When we pay our tithings in a general fast offering, that's consecration. In fact, tithing was still a component of the United Order. All the increase, all the income people would have from their stewardships, if their stewardship involved some kind of uh, revenue generating uh, 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 endeavor, uh, like a, you know, a blacksmith shop or a farm, they would still pay tithing of their surplus. And um, so we, the law of tithing is still consecration, a generous fast offering, and other offerings we may make to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for the building of Zion and for you know, financing the, 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 the operations of the, the church, the mission of the church, you know, preaching the gospel and uh, uh, building and maintaining temples and so on. When we accept and uh, serve in our callings, in our wards and branches, that's consecration. We're consecrating our time, our talents. Uh, when we are serving one another as ministering sisters and ministering brothers that's consecration as well and uh, we're consecrating our time we're consecrating our talents our knowledge of the scriptures our words of the prophets to bring words of comfort and inspiration uh, to those who may be experiencing challenges and so the law of consecration is still very much a part of our lives even though we don't have stewardships or the united order Another way by which we can say that uh, the law of conspiracy is very much alive is by observing the, what I call, leftovers of the United Order that we have in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. For example, um, our welfare program in the church, you know, self-reliance uh, is uh, a major component of the temporal salvation for our people. And um, the way the church welfare program was designed, okay, it included elements such as bishop storehouses, and uh, as I mentioned, consecrations in the form of uh, fast offerings and other, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, tithing and fast offerings and other contributions, and. Um, the philosophy or the principles behind assistance that the Lord indicated in that revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants are very much still part of the administration of uh, assistance. Bishops and stake presidents, yes, we, we will uh, assist people in ways that they will be amply supplied, just as the revelation stated, according to their wants and according to their needs in as much as their wants are just or justifiable. This is what the First Presidency stated in 1936 
when they set up the uh, the, the the welfare program, President Hubert J. Grant stated, "Our primary purpose was to set up, in so far as it might be possible, a system under which the curse of idleness would be done away, the evils of a dole, a freebie, okay, the evils of a dole abolished, and independence." industry, thrift, and self-respect be once more established amongst our people. The aim of the church is to help the people to help themselves. Work is to be re-enthroned as the ruling principle in the lives of our church membership. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of the church welfare system. I discussed that at length in another class uh, of mine, uh, Religion 480, Church Organization and Leadership. And you may look for a video on the church welfare system there where I repeat some of these scriptures, but I go into the administration of church welfare. And I show a diagram that I'm going to uh, show you here. Uh, and this diagram shows you uh, the areas, if you will, of uh, um, personal preparedness and family preparedness and also the elements of the church welfare organization. Uh, but as I said, I'm not going to get into all these details here. This is a matter for another time and another class. But I hope these explanations are um, sufficient for you to, to have this general overview, superficial overview of how the, uh, the law of consecration and stewardship and the United Order uh, function, what they meant and how they would function. And I'm assuming that you have plenty of questions. So feel free to get in touch with me. You know how to get a hold of me. So send me an email and uh, I'll be very glad to entertain questions that you might have. Until then, may the Lord bless you. All the best to you. Bye.